All right. Boom. Well, it looks like I am live. Um, not sure if anybody is in here. I have another display on the side, so I'm assuming this is just um, a little bit delayed. Oh yeah, see, now there we go. Popping in right there. Just kind of see what's going on. All right. Yeah. Boom. Okay. Well, Sweet. It looks like I am live. Um, well, not sure. If it's good to be here, friends. We made it to here. the end of another display what has been on the side. So I'm by far the craziest year that I've um, ever experienced. A little bit delayed. Um, oh yeah. See, my there wife and go. I hopping in right there. <laughs> got pregnant at the beginning of the year. On. Had All the right. pandemic happen. Yeah. Made it through the end okay. of the year. Had another kid. Um, like you know, alive. it's just been uh, well, a wild, wild sure. ride. It's good to be here, The friends. vast majority of my wedding got postponed or canceled. Um, so the craziest and so the fact that I <laughs> sort of have a YouTube channel is kind of fun my now, but I uh, it was a nice creative order, endeavor for me to sort of be able to find something else to learn and do and everything like that. And well, I'm just super, super thankful. It's good to be here for the I even made it to uh, my wedding sort of survived this whole pandemic canceled. thing. Uh, oh, I've got some double crazy. audio going so on. Oh, it's probably from the I... iPad. Thanks for letting me know. Let me know if that fixed it. Uh, it should be all good. Everything else should be muted. So let me know. All right. We're a little bit delayed here, so it might be just doubling the audio another way let's see let me know if we fixed it all good now sweet we are on a, a bit of a delay probably like a good 10 second now that I'm looking at the actual thing so um, cool well thanks guys um, let me know if in the comments you guys have any questions I have I don't know probably like 40 or so uh, probably actually more than that now that I'm kind of scrolling through them that I got via Instagram. So I'll go and try to hit some of those. I tried to just pull a bunch of random cameras, not random cameras. These are pretty much like my mainstays. It's not like they're just random ones. Um, but yeah, thanks guys. Appreciate all of the, the hellos and letting me know. This is definitely my first time ever going live on YouTube. So you know, there could be a ton of stuff that goes wrong here. And if it does, oh well, I tried. It's kind of like the theme of this year, right? Um, so anyway, I figured I will just kind of jump on, uh, go through some of the, A, these questions. I'll try to be paying attention. Yeah, let me know where you are kind of heading in from and saying hi from. Uh, Thousand Islands, that's pretty cool. I don't know if you know where that is in Canada, but that's cool. SF, love it. Hello, friends. Uh, it's kind of bizarre to see this because I have it on my iPad. What's going to you live and then what's actually happening on this side. So uh, I can definitely see there's a decent delay. But anyway, uh, I'll try to roll through some of these questions and then I will try to be kind of paying attention to the chat as we go. Um, <laughs> and you know what, why not? Uh, Namula Jimmy, I don't even know what Namula is, but uh, can we buy an M9 sensor replaced camera? I don't know if, I don't think Leica, first of all, I am not affiliated with Leica in any way other than the fact that I just love their cameras. So it's definitely not something that uh, I am an expert on by any means, but it's something that I just really am kind of passionate about and enjoy. So it's going to be uh, something that I oddly know a lot about. I used to have an M9, so I'll answer your question and try to right away. I used to have an M9 and mine did have sensor corrosion. So I found that for two or three years, Leica, you could send it in and they would replace the sensor for free. I believe they've discontinued that service. And so I think there's a uh, third party company or something like that that does it now. So um, I, you can definitely buy them with replaced sensors, but um, you definitely have to kind of flip that out. Um, what's up, Simon? I, I have had a lot of questions about my 28 millimeter lens. Uh, I definitely haven't done any videos or anything about it, 
but here I can, can even switch over. And so, so this is, a, if I can give this to focus, company or something this like is my 28 so, millimeter Sunicron. Um, it you is the lens that I've been trying to buy sensors, and but, trying to get um, for the last. You definitely have to kind of flip that. I out. don't know, um, two three years, uh, and I'll definitely I, I do a video a on it. I picked about up the 28 millimeter uh, lens. Voigtlander Ultron uh, a couple years ago. Any videos or anything and about it? But it's been great, especially so on is, digital, or not especially on digital, especially on film. This, is my this lens works so great, and I have no issues. I, it, but it's the lens way that I try to buy on trying to get um, for the last digital, I shoot this thing wide I open know, in like um, very three extreme. Years, uh, and I'll definitely I have do a, a video a on it. Well, I will. Sorry, guys. I will make sure that uh, the audio on that's crushed. Double echo. I don't know why the my iPad. Uh, keeps coming unmuted for some reason. So let me know. That should be fixed. I just turned the volume all the way down on everything except for the actual microphone. So, and again, we're like super delayed. So it takes me a little bit to find out. So apologies for that. Let me know if it's fixed. But these two uh, lenses are uh, significantly different in price, about 10 times different. But the way that I photograph the 28 millimeter um, and most of my lenses is m mostly wide open because I'm often shooting at really, really kind of like dark environments as a wedding photographer. And so I need kind of like excellent performance. So that's why I picked up the 28 millimeter Summicron. To be honest, like I bought it uh, for a lot of money. Uh, it's the most money I've ever spent on a lens. And so it's kind of like, I, I'm trying to make it one of my main two lenses. So my main kind of kit moving forward is going to be these kind of three is gonna be like the mainstays. So the Leica M240 with the 50 millimeter, the Leica, or not M240, the Leica M10 with the 50 Sumalux the Leica M10 with the 28 Summicron. I find that the 2850 pairs a little bit better than the 35 does with 3550. Um, but the problem basically is just how stinking expensive everything is. I would love to have a 28 Sumalux, but those even used are like 5,000 plus. So probably not in the cards for quite a while. Um, but I actually finally, after years of people asking for it, filmed a video on the Zeiss 35 millimeter uh, 1.4 Distagon. And this lens honestly is incredible. I kind of have a love hate with it because it's so big, but in going through the images I've made with it over the last couple of years, I don't know, I've just been super impressed by it. and. Um, if it was just a little bit smaller, you can kind of see the difference. It's just like such a big lens, especially when you toss that hood on. Um, and you can see that the barrel of it is wider as well. And so it just like feels a lot more, I don't know, front heavy and just doesn't carry as well as some of the other, I don't know, Leicas do. Oh, there we go. Um, it's not super, super heavy, but it just, I think it's because it's longer as well. Um, kind of just makes things a little bit more difficult to make it as like an everyday carry kind of camera. And that's what I kind of want to do is simplify, just get everything to be where I want it. Um, and so that's why kind of like investing in the Summicron was something I really wanted to do because it, it doubles as like a great everyday carry lens and because it's just so dang light. And then F2 at 28 millimeters is a little bit easier because you can usually shoot your shutter speed about a stop lower than at 50. And with the increased ISO performance of the M10s, it makes it a little bit easier as well. So I would honestly love to get the, the Sumalux, but again, those things are just so stinking expensive. All right, so let's go. Um, and if anybody hasn't seen, I did a, a video with my son yesterday. Uh, we posted it where we went out and photographed on the X100V and the X100F. My son is four <laughs> and um, 
he took some really, really good photos. So if you are just kind of in the mood to see something a little bit slightly heartwarming and um, I don't know, it feels like it got back to like sort of the essence of photography. He literally knows nothing about photography. He just like can point this thing at something that he thinks is interesting and take a photo. And so if you want to jump on uh, after this video or something like that and watch that, I found that obviously I'm going to be biased, but I found it to be a pretty fun video. And uh, yeah, he actually took some really good photos. He's not a bad photographer. So yeah, he crushed it. I do love that people are roasting me in the comments saying that uh, his photos are all better than mine. Even F Fujifilm Bulgaria, I think, like commented and made fun of me on it. Yeah, we live, Daniel. What's up, dude? Uh, if anybody hasn't subscribed to Daniel's channel, uh, he is basically like Russell Wilson from the Seahawks, like personal photographer and videographer and everything like that. And he has a bunch of really cool behind the scenes stuff um, from games and stuff like that because he's actually like on, well, not the sidelines because he can't really do that. But yeah. So anyway, I think uh, going back to my video that I made with my son, I think I might actually try it out next time and do like a point and shoot review. So I have obviously these, um, like my two main point and shoots are the uh, Fujifilm Class W and the Contax T2. Um, a lot of people are just so scared to shoot film. And I think that, yeah, second shooter in training. I think that if I could, just give a, a, a film camera, even maybe a different one that's not a point and shoot to just kind of prove that things aren't that hard. I think it'd be a fun little thing to just show how, I don't know, like easy shooting film is because so many people have such like a, I don't know, a, a worry about shooting film that they're gonna ruin everything, but it's so easy. And uh, I was listening to uh, I was listening to a, a thing on Clubhouse, that new app that's like a, basically like a live interactive podcast almost. Um, and I was listening to a, one with um, some film photographers last night. And some of them were just talking about how like digital is the thing that scares them. And digital is the thing that's hard. Um, because A, film is just really forgiving. And then B, like it just looks good. You know, you get to like just send it off to a lab, they scan it, uh, and it just looks awesome. So, Santa came back. Yeah, man, I, I do feel very Santa-y with this hat on, especially, um, but you know. <laughs> Next time, give him a Mamiya. I don't even, actually, I just sold my, my only Mamiya camera, so. Uh, Although I do really, 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 my, my two cameras that are on my ultimate wish list right now uh, that are completely out of budget are the Pentax 672 with the 105 2.4. I've had that camera on my mind for a decade probably. And then I know that it is like the, the cool camera to have on YouTube these days. Not that a, a Leica isn't, but the uh, Mamiya 7 or 7.2 I obviously am very obsessed with rangefinders, and so having a medium format rangefinder is something that I really, really want. And I've never had uh, a six seven camera, and so I've really wanted that um, thing in specific. <laughs> Why do all my out of focus film shots look better than my in focus digital stuff? I think that's the thing about like shooting film. The thing about it is if. It, my my kind of take on it is as long as you are front focused, it looks good. If you're back focused, it looks like a mistake. If it's front focused, it looks kind of dreamy. So that is like one of my random like wedding, especially like wedding stuff slightly front focused just looks dreamy. And so uh, it's kind of like when in doubt front focus and then you just call it like fine art photography. Dude, yeah. Um, <laughs> what's up Tay? So, Tay is the one that, uh, actually, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing your name right. I just made that up. But uh, he's the one that sold me this 28 Sumicron. So shouts to him. Um, yeah, man, I'm, I'm stoked on it. I've obviously been wanting it forever and I, I'll definitely do a video on it. I did a quick comparison video with the, um, with the Voigtlander. And so, I will definitely do like a full review on it at some point once I put a lot of photos through it. But 
I think my main thing was trying to figure out, I was for years trying to figure out the difference uh, between the two and realize that not a lot of people are going to be doing that. So, um, let's see here. If I tried the Pro Photo Flash, so I have like the the what what the A1 or the A1X or whatever. If that's what you're asking, I'm not really sure about um, if that's yeah. Buy my 35 Cron, dude. I want that lens back so bad. Um, but the um, I haven't used any on camera Pro Photo Flashes. I have used. Um, like the B1X and the off-camera stuff, um, just triggered via the hot shoe, but I haven't done anything uh, like that. But I'm gonna grab the flash that I actually use real quick. So I used to use uh, a completely different one, um, but one of the things that I didn't like about it was that I like to be able to rotate and fire this, bounce flash this at the ceiling. Um, and I like to have this little bounce card. It's kind of like the old school, like photojournalist way of doing it. And so these are the tiny Godox TT 350s. And they're super small. They fit well on a Leica. And so, yeah, they're great. You can turn the flash and bounce it off the side walls whatever, um, and they're like 60, 70, 80 bucks, something really small. They only take two AA batteries. The flash recycle is fast enough for me. So um, yeah, it's a, great, it's a great thing. I don't know if I have it linked in my description, but if not, I probably should. But anyway, uh, if you click on any of the Amazon links in the description though, and then go buy this, that would be extra helpful because that's how YouTubers make a little bit of side money. <laughs> um, I had a question about, um, and it's sort of being answered by someone else on the M10P and M10D. So the M10D, for those who don't know, and the M10P, the P version always has like a, a quieter shutter. And I think on the M10s, it has a touch screen. But then it is just like the one that looks really, really cool that has like the Leica engraving. I don't have, I used to have an M2 that had like the Leica stuff on the top. Um, but I just save myself a couple thousand dollars every time and put tape over the Leica dots. So the M10Ps are cool. I think they, if I had unlimited budget, I would buy them because they look the coolest, uh, but I don't. And so I'm fine with buying the cheapest ones I can afford. Um, and then the N10D is the one, to my knowledge, that doesn't have a rear LCD screen, uh, which for a strictly personal camera would be really fun because it's one of the things that I love about shooting film is that when you kind of like, you know, are shooting and stuff like that, you don't immediately see your, your picture at the end. Like if you went and looked, like my, my son will be like, daddy, can I see the picture? And I'll be like, yeah, sorry, bud. Um, but the nice thing about it is it keeps you in the moment. So you're not like chimping on the back. You're not looking and trying to figure out what, um, you know, it, like I just, I my uh, three month old was just taking a bath in the sink this morning. We were giving him a bath in the sink and I took some photos on this lens and camera combination. But the thing is I probably took like six photos because I would take it and look, take it and look. Um, and with the, you know, film camera or whatever, I take like one, maybe two, and then just like see what happens. So makes it kind of fun to just kind of have like a completely different setup in that way. Uh, I know a few people that have the M10D and again, for like just a strictly personal camera, I might do it. But the thing, one of the things about like a, cameras in general, I hear that's fixed on the M10R, but when you blow the highlights, they're gone. So you have like a, an eighth of a stop of exposure uh, leniency in the highlights. So if I did have one, I would basically shoot it at negative one EV at least at all times. Um, so I, I usually shoot, uh, as you can see, my cameras are both on auto right now, which is very odd for me. Like I never have my cameras on auto when I'm photographing weddings and professional work. Um, mainly because when you do that, 
Um, you need to see like, so that's a nice thing about the M10s and sorry about this is wiggling a little bit, but the M10s um, have the ISO up here and, and you know, it kind of has everything. You, you set your aperture here, your shutter speed here, your ISO here. Um, and it's only been in the last couple of months that I've just been shooting things on auto um, like, and just setting everything. My minimum shutter speed is like 1 125th on here. And it's honestly been great. I just set my exposure compensation to negative uh, 0.7 and it's honestly been pretty good. Like I, um, for the most part, always end up with stuff that works. And then especially with the X100s, I have honestly just been shooting this entire thing all the time. My, I always just set it at negative 0.7 on here as well. So um, it's pretty much always given me completely usable stuff. And I don't know if I've actually used it on anything but auto because it's just a personal camera at, at the moment at least. And the thing that I was blown away by when I was doing some review kind of shooting, I you know brought it to when we drove around and saw family for Christmas, you know, through the car window and yards and stuff, um, was that the highlight recovery out of this is absurdly good in comparison to the Leicas. Um, so um, I had a few questions uh, as well about uh, I'm. I'm using Ecamm Live, um, and the nice thing about Ecamm is without using any additional software, I can actually just plug my cameras. So uh, above me, I have a uh, Canon EOS 200D, like it's a SL2, like the cheap Canon Rebel thing. That's just what my overhead cam is. And then the EOS R is my main, you know, this camera it has the Sigma 24. Uh, 1.4 and I just can plug these straight in no additional software or anything like that and yeah it's great uh, it makes it super easy and then I can also even this is gonna be kind of like a mind trip but I can broadcast from my iPad as well um, so all of that kind of like works really really well and I can shoot actually in log and put LUT on it uh, everything like that. It's all pretty good. So, um, I did get a lot of M10 versus M240 questions. Um, and I guess this one where you asked, um, anything that I miss about the M240, the only possible thing, the only thing that I miss about the M240 was the black version was black paint. And so some of the places where it rubbed and stuff like that had that really cool brassing where you see the brass color underneath the paint. And then the paint is obviously a little bit more shiny and stuff. Um, the new M10 kind of matches my M6, which is cool, but the black paint is just like the epitome of like a cool. But everything else about the M10, I feel like is just slightly superior. So. You know, the, the slight, I think it's a four millimeter difference between the M10 and the M240. And honestly, that tiny, tiny difference, just like the difference in like 50 grams or like a few millimeters in, you know, um, like lens length makes a big difference. It's kind of how it is. And so I honestly do really think that the M10s were worth it for me. If I was doing just personal stuff, it would be a total like vanity and fun purchase. I do think that it's 100% gonna be worthwhile for my work. Um, but for the things that I do personally, the M240 definitely would have done the job just as well as the M10. But um, part of this whole thing is the M10 is like inspiring, especially picking up the 28 Sumicron because it's so small. Um, and so, it just makes me again want to carry this thing around more often. So, yeah, shout out to Cosmotographer because he was the one that finally hooked me up with this lens. Um, so, boom, I will try to hit. I don't know if I got how many of these comments got me. I know you guys are kind of talking back and forth about some stuff, which is super helpful. Um, I do really like 
the concept of the X-Pro3 as well. I owned the X-Pro1 a long time ago. I don't know how it happened, but Fuji sent me one, which was great, um, and it was super fun. Okay, yeah, that is the one thing. The M10 battery is probably 25% worse. This is me just guesstimating than the M240 battery. So if I could have the battery life of the M240, that would, that would be the winner. Um, but it's not detrimental enough that it wasn't worth it because um, the battery is like half the size. Uh, well, probably not half the size, but uh, I would love, again, to get back on that topic. I, I do love the X-Pro3. I tried one out when I was speaking at a conference in Canada, and I loved the, the hybrid viewfinder, and I think that Fuji is like the best value for that kind of like more retro and the like an inspiring camera design. So I do really like that, but it, it would just be me jumping in and um, like I would have to buy into a whole new system. Um, and that's kind of like the reason why the Fuji X100V made a lot of sense because it's just kind of like a system in a camera right there. Uh, works really well. What's up, Gadgen? Dude, good to see you, man. Uh, but yeah, I think that I, I would really like it. I think that Again, yeah, it's it's like the camera that is inspiring and makes me do want... It also solves the chimping issue, yeah. Uh, I do really want that. I think that, honestly, though, my improvement to that camera without actually using it was I would love... I actually don't have a camera. My ca two cameras with swivel screens are the ones I'm filming with, but I think the swivel screen idea would make a lot of sense because most of the time when I'm shooting with the EOS R, I turn the screen around anyway and face it inside. So you get that same feeling of like not being able to chimp. So if you turn that on the inside, uh, then you get a back that's just like completely blank, which would be great. Um, but then you get the full articulating everything else about it on the X-Pro3, which, which would be nice if they did that. This on the Fujifilm uh, is cool. But it, the only thing it doesn't make any sense on is if you're taking any vertical photos, like this doesn't articulate this way up and down. So I do like this. So it's fun for me to like get down low and take photos of my kid and stuff like that. And I think street shooting from this like lower perspective, kind of like, uh, you know, like a, a Hasselblad or something like that would be fun. But it is a little bit of a bummer that it doesn't articulate up and down this way as well. So I find that to be like my, not that there's any like really gripes about this camera, um, cause it's great. I do think that it's like a little bit expensive to be honest, but it is not to spoil my X100V review by any means, but I, I do honestly think it is a professional grade camera. Now that they have added the new lens, they've redesigned the lens, I did some sharpness comparison tests where I just like took my Hasselblad out in the side yard. It's what I've been comparing all these other lenses to and stuff as well. Um, I took it out on my side yard and did some just sharpness tests close up and, and far back and stuff like that. And it performs incredibly well. Like it is from a sharpness standpoint uh, on not on maybe not on par with the Leicas and maybe not on par with the Zeiss or whatever, but I would definitely say it's like a professional grade lens in this tiny, tiny, tiny form factor. Like, um, and the autofocus works good enough. And I definitely used to shoot and photograph weddings on far inferior cameras to this one. And so, yeah, I think you could honestly have a kit. Uh, where you had this camera and maybe like an X-E3 with a, with a 35 and then like an X-Pro3 with the 56 on Fuji. And like, you probably legitimately have a decent kit. You could probably get one of each too. You could probably get the GFX if you really wanted to spend a little bit more money and get like a 50 equivalent. So like there's 63, I think. Um, you get that for your 50 and then shoot the 56 or whatever on an X-Pro3, and then you'd have three of the best Fuji cameras and you'd have a complete kit. So anyway, I think that would be pretty sweet. All right, I'm gonna jump in and try to grab some of these cameras. 
these cameras. I just saw cameras everywhere and said cameras, but I meant questions. Um, here's a good one because it's it's not camera related at all. Um, so the person asks, have you ever had a point in your photo career that you hated what you were doing? Yes. I don't think I've ever hated photography in particular, but I definitely hated, um, I hated what I had allowed my life to become, if that makes sense. So if you've heard me talk at some workshops or conferences, you might've heard me tell this story, but um, a few years ago, I think I was in Italy and I had been traveling, you know, all, all summer long. And I was, I think, I think this was in the fall traveling all summer long. I hadn't really seen people. I'd just been working like all summer. I'd traveled to like 22, 21 different locations. This was 22. So it was at the end. And I shot like 38 weddings to that point and just was like gone almost like most of the weekends during the summer. Didn't go camping, didn't see my family much, like didn't see my friends, didn't go to church, like just didn't do all the things that are kind of like a normal part of my life. Um, and I made it to, you know, this destination wedding in Italy, everything was beautiful. I was just like doing all of the things that the industry had told me was like the pinnacle of being awesome. I was like in a cool place. I was super successful in that I'd booked so many weddings. I was traveling for all of them because that looks cool on social media. And then I was just like, I mean, obviously I was tired and overwhelmed, but like, I just went, is this it? Like this, I thought that doing all these things would fulfill me and it didn't. And I remember just sitting at this bus stop uh, in Italy and just like crying, <laughs> just weeping because I was just like, man, all of this stuff, I'm doing all the things that the industry told me would make me successful and fulfilled and everything like that. And it was like a total letdown. Um, and so I think that's the time where, um, yeah, I didn't like hate what I was doing, but I hated, yeah, what I had allowed my life in that to become because I have like a whole talk on this. So I'm trying not to like dovetail into it too much, but I think that, this job as a photographer can be amazing and incredible, but if I'm not a good person at saying no, and I'm really bad at that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, I just like, <laughs> I had a soul moment, sure. Uh, but it was just one of those times where I, I just like realized that all my priorities were out of whack. I was doing what I thought was expected of me, not what I knew my life needed at the time, if that makes sense. So always trying to kind of like reevaluate those things. Um, and just a quick little antidote while I'm on that topic as well, um, because it's the end of the year and that's what this kind of stuff's for. Uh, I was once given the uh, analogy that you only have the, uh, the ability to hold on to so many things in your life. And so you have to figure out and prioritize what those things are. This has really nothing to do with photography, but this is just life advice in general. Uh, but especially with social media and entrepreneurship and stuff like that, it's ends up being really, really, I don't know, important. So you only have the ability to hold on to so many things in your life. So you have to figure out what those things are. And then as life goes on, other things come in and are constantly trying to like vie for your attention, right? So maybe it's uh, another gig or another opportunity or, um, anything else that might just take the place of what's important. So for me, that's like my family and like my faith or the two things that I've decided, like those are the things I wanna like hold on to. Um, and as I kind of like, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm like I was saying, uh, traveling too much, that's gonna be taking time away from my family and things that are important. And so as I, you know, try to like let other things take this out, this thing opens up and then the things that are most important in my life start kind of sliding through the cracks, right? So the more that I um, allow myself to, yeah, unprioritize my life, the more that I open up so that other things can get in and then the things that matter most start sliding out. And I've seen that happen with so many people where, you know, they've just put their careers before family, spouses, kids, whatever. Um, and I never really want to be that. So um, I try to, yeah, 
have my wife speak into my life, which she is very good at doing. So uh, if I ever get off that path too much, I definitely feel like she is a really good counter. And then I will say too that whatever industry or whatever thing you're in, having people in your life outside of whatever bubble that may be uh, is super grounding. So, you know, if you were only in the wedding photography industry or the film photography industry or whatever your thing might be, and those are the only people you're interacting with, sometimes that bubble can be just unrealistic. And so maybe for me, it has been, you know, friends that I've played music with or whatever that don't give two craps about what I do as a photographer, you know? So uh, anyway, just my two cents there. Uh, it's just stuff that I've always been kind of chewing on and, and uh, have been really meaningful me for me in the past. Um, let's see here. Back to... Um, a quick little thing right here. Someone asked, uh, this is a total gear question. Uh, this is my 90 millimeter Sumicron. It's uh, a Sumicron. This is a quick little like a vocabulary glossary lexicon thing. All those things in Leica land are just like Noctilux is anything below F1.4. Anything below F2 is Sumilux. Anything below... I think 2.4 technically is Sumicron. Um, Sumerit is like 2.4, 2.5 up to 2.8. Anything under 2.8 is Elmerit, I think. Anyway, all those things are just basically ways that Leica uses fancy letters to make you understand what aperture the things are basically. Uh, it's not a lens design or anything like that. It's just the aperture setting. I find that my old 90 is really, really hard to do. Um, it's really hard to focus. And I think I'm gonna send it in to Leica to have them calibrate it to an M10 body for me. Um, because I think that I should, I feel like I'm really, really good with a rangefinder, And so I'm perplexed that I can't focus this well. Um, the other lens that I picked up recently to try out that I've, I've filmed a review video on as well is this 75, uh, it's not a Noctilux like clone or anything like that. I believe it's actually a super old lens design, but it's the 75 1.25 from uh, Seven Artisan. And I can focus this thing. Uh, so I think that honestly, it's my, it might be the lens that doesn't work, but I've been using it on the EOS R and with a Visiflex for a long time. Um, but this lens uh, is huge and kind of ridiculous, but for like 450 bucks, it was kind of fun to try out. Um, and I'm still kind of undecided whether I'm gonna keep it or not. It has that glow, which basically translates, ooh, excuse me, translates into looking like a Jedi Force ghost. <laughs> uh, so at 1.25, but at F2, it's usable-ish, uh, and 2.8 is definitely usable. Um, boom. Cool, so using an EVF or something like that or on another camera is the best way to go unless you're shooting at infinity. So far for me, I will try to report back once I've gotten that lens calibrated. Um, and then I have just a ton of questions about focusing on a rangefinder itself. Um, so for those who don't know, the Leica system, you're not actually looking through the lens. I will do, actually I can do like a quick little tutorial video on this for anybody that's sort of interested. Um, so in a rangefinder, you can see that you can see straight through the back of the viewfinder, right? So you can see it right in there where you can kind of just see it directly through. Um, and I definitely need to <laughs> clean my viewfinder. So also a quick tip, always clean your viewfinder and your rainfinder patch. Uh, so what happens is you have your viewfinder here and then you have the rangefinder patch. And I believe it's called a coincident rangefinder where you have um, in here, you have frame lines and stuff like that to give you a guide of where you're focusing at but then this little patch ends up superimposing and slightly overlaying in the viewfinder. And then what you have to do is you have to line the two images up. So um, 
like you'll see like a ghost, an image, and then a ghost image, and you have to line the two things up to make them in focus. And then if your lens is calibrated correctly and your rangefinder is calibrated correctly, which I've actually calibrated this rangefinder myself because it came a little bit uncalibrated, unfortunately. Um, and thankfully it's a digital camera, so it's, it's much easier. But then if you're calibrated correctly, then anything that you line up in between those two things will be in focus by just the mechanical system uh, that is a rangefinder. So the thing in doing that for me is um, I shoot my stuff wide open most of the time when I'm shooting portrait and wedding work, which for most people is crazy. But if I can line those two things up, I'm good. I'm in focus. I know I am. Um, so what I've gotten really good at is A, judging distance. So when I pick my camera up, I already kind of have an idea of how far away something is. So that as I'm already pulling my camera up to my eye, like if I'm gonna take a photo of my camera here that I'm doing, I know that it's about eh, a meter-ish away. And I know that a meter-ish away is about right here. Eh, a little bit more than that. But when I pull it up to my eye, I am that far away. I had to move maybe an inch forward um, because I already knew just the general distance and I memorize everything um, just in general where I, you know, am gonna be. So understanding that and having a, a good idea of where your lenses focus and where kind of like the focus throw and everything like that is, mainly memorizing the middle. So like on the middle is like right in that like four-ish feet mark on this camera and like, you know, ish on, on that as well. So having those kind of things as like muscle memory is really, really helpful. Um, and then the nice thing about weddings is like, for the most part, people walk at a consistent pace. So as long as you can nail focus, then someone walking to you at a consistent pace, you can move that lens at a consistent pace as well, one way or the other. Um, and you can get that focus to kind of like work with you as well. Um, so that part definitely makes it easier, but um, the other thing for me, if someone's wearing glasses, it's easy. You wanna find the part of your subject or whatever with maximum contrast. So that is really, really easy. So I find some people say to focus on eyes, but depending on skin tone, sometimes the thing that's easier is either glasses um, or what's up Landis? Dude, good to see you. Uh, so glasses are a point of high contrast or eyebrows. So eyebrows on people that have a lighter skin complexion can be really easy. Uh, people with darker skin complexion, it can be the eyes. But again, I also find that a slight front focus looks okay. So focusing on someone's uh, glasses is a great thing. Um, unless you're really up close and then you can obviously focus on the eyes. Um, and then also understanding the plane of focus in general. So because your focus patch is only in the middle um, of a viewfinder, if you want to compose someone on the other side, you're gonna wanna find something that is near that same plane of focus on the other side. Um, so an example is when someone's walking towards me at a wedding, this is a like, really weird example, but I don't want their head to be in the middle of the frame if they're walking down the aisle because then their feet will be cut off. So if they're holding a bouquet or a, uh, a guy often is wearing uh, a jacket with a lighter shirt underneath and if they're on the side closest to me, then that is a point of high contrast and then I can focus a little bit in front of that uh, and a, a, a bridesmaid often is carrying a bouquet and the bouquet is out in front of them a little bit and so I can focus down because it's lower. Um, and then usually that bouquet where that is lines up with where their eyes are by the time they get there. And so it's a really weird thing. And I'll, I'll probably have to do a video specifically on shooting weddings with a rangefinder because there's a ton of things like that. Um, but those are some of my kind of quick tips. Um, and then the other thing would just be to, if you're new to rangefinder focusing in general, just like stop your lens down, shoot things at f4 for a while until you're getting really good results and then shoot it f2.8 for a while until you're getting good results and then you know just kind of like move through that whole system 
uh, until you're consistent enough that everything kind of makes sense. Um, so hopefully that answered it because I definitely have uh, a lot of a lot of questions about focusing with the rangefinder. Um, <laughs> my friend Gene, uh, Gene Yoon, who just started his own YouTube channel, and uh, I saw that he made a post about 2020 today, and I didn't get to watch it, but uh, definitely check out his channel. He asked, which is a funny question because I, I'm really new to this thing of YouTube anyway. He said, best advice for photographers to find their voice on YouTube and grow their channel. Uh, dude, I, first of all, uh, thank you to, for Gene for thinking I have a voice in growing my channel. Uh, also, just wanted to kind of jump in and say, I see a bunch of people that are jumping in uh, <laughs> and saying hi from around the world. That is super fun to see people from. I saw like Netherlands, Japan. Uh, so if you're tuning in from somewhere random, wherever it is, even if you're tuning in from down the street from where I live, uh, just pop in and say hi because that's always kind of fun to see. Uh, but the thing for me, the reason I started a YouTube channel specifically was I shoot with very weird cameras and tools and things like that, that I was just not seeing a lot of videos on. So I've watched every video that exists on YouTube about this seven artisans, 75 millimeter F 1.25. And while some of them are really good, it didn't answer the question that I specifically had about this lens. Um, and so I bought this with my own money and made a review video on it because I wanted to answer the same questions that I had about my own stuff, right? Um, and thankfully, like on some of these, like TT Artisan reached out and sent me this 50 millimeter lens, which is legitimately amazing for the price if you haven't looked at that video. Um, and so there are things like that, that I just really wanted to check out. I wanted to know, I've watched every single video that exists on the 28 millimeter Sumicron. And by every single video, I think there are like three, maybe on this version. <laughs> um, and so I just wanted to make videos that uh, would have been helpful for me in my search. I wanna answer the questions that I had. Um, and so, yeah, that was kind of my take on why I started a YouTube channel. And also, uh, if I'm being honest, uh, dude, also thanks for everyone that is saying hi from where they're at. That's super fun. Um, yeah, I love that. Chile, Chile, sorry. Uh, Northern Ireland, Spain, Yosemite, Jersey, Canada, uh, Hong Kong. Gosh, that's super fun. Uh, but I also have been a professional photographer for, I shot my first wedding almost 14 years ago now. And so I've just shot probably millions of photos at this time professionally. Um, and so the demand that I have on gear and I think my perspective is a little bit unique in that uh, like I just finished uh, filming the video that I had on my 35 millimeter um, Zeiss 35 Distagon. And in finding samples from that lens, I have photographed probably a hundred weddings and elopements on it combined. And between those things have probably photographed a hundred thousand photos. Like in all of the times that I've used this lens, I've probably shot 80,000 to a hundred thousand photos with this lens. So in getting a gear review from me, on something like this, you're getting like incredible perspective because like I, I highly doubt that anybody else that is going to review this lens has taken that many photos from that lens. Um, and I've also photographed, I think when I was doing that video, I compared, I think I, I this is my fifth or maybe sixth different 35 millimeter lens that I've owned um, for this system. And so, I don't know. It's like that's that's kind of my my thing is like as a wedding photographer, I take like thousands of images with stuff, um, and so that kind of makes my perspective and my, the amount of samples and stuff like that I have normally uh, a lot different, right? Um, boom! A lot of questions rolling in too. Uh, I'll try to kind of <laughs> hello from Mars, dude. Okay, first of all, I might as well just say it. I don't know who like the double low O person is 
but whoever you are, your comments are usually pretty hilarious. So uh, keep up the good work, whoever you are, uh, because I definitely appreciate them. Uh, I will I will cover that, Mike. You said, uh, do you have a different kind of wedding clients because of the kind of gear you're using? People respect or like it, or is just another tool? Uh, both. So I think I'm gonna ha I'm just gonna do a video about weddings with Leica cameras um, and how I, I think Matt Day did a video about size mattering and stuff like that in cameras, um, but. I will definitely do a video about the kind of psychology of shooting Leica cameras as well, because it's definitely different and it's one of the reasons that I choose them, uh, but it's gonna be a lot more in depth. Um, John, because I just saw your video and it would be really, really easy. Um, if you have the M240 and you have a 50 Summicron and you don't want to spend a lot of money, the Voigtlander, even though I'm selling this <laughs> uh, because I picked up the, the Summicron, the Voigtlander 28 millimeter F2 would be a great lens to pair with your kit if you don't want to spend the money on a Summicron and you don't care about corner sharpness wide open. That is my like quick uh, two cents about what your, your pick would be. Uh, you could definitely buy one of the Leica 2.8s if you want to as well, but... Uh, just a quick thing. The Voigtlander is pretty great for the price. Um, cool. Let's go. I got lots of other questions on here too. And I barely got into any of the ones on Instagram. Sorry, team. Uh, 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 um. Let's see. If photography was not a career option, what would you be doing? I really, really wanted to play music when I was in high school and college. And I'll show you... Outside of my cameras that are legacy things that I love, I'll show you my other kind of prized possession. It's on my wall right next to me. This is for those who play guitar or care about this kind of stuff at all. This is a Gibson, a, a 1960. So this is kind of like the, the range of things that I love are things from like the 60s, uh, late 50s, 60s. So this is a Gibson... 1960 Gibson ES330T. It has a single P90 pickup, and I know that I'm probably gonna lose a bunch of people on here um, for talking about guitars, but I think, and I might even do a video that goes into the psychology behind just all this stuff and things and gear that's inspiring, but this is my other outside of guitars, my prized possession. <laughs> and I will not be playing you a song uh, as much as would be kind of fun. And this thing is like barely even in tune. But it is maybe the most beautiful thing that I own. Um, and it's lightweight and freaking. It's it's like, yeah. Outside of cameras, uh, it's, it's my favorite thing that I own. So anyway, definitely off topic. I just like slammed a three four thousand dollar guitar into the wall. <laughs> Do you got one with a Bigsby? I love that. Yeah, that thing sounds amazing. It only has a single pickup, but for just a rhythm guitar, um, it's it's my favorite guitar ever. So anyway, um, so to answer that question, I really wanted to play music and I wanted to be a music producer. Uh, I'm not an amazing musician, but I can play most instruments to a uh, a competent level for most bands. So I can play most instruments well enough. So I really love uh, the idea of being able to be someone that collaborates well. In any band that I've ever been in, I was I always felt like I was the guy that like could help kind of like mesh everything together. That's why I wanted to be like a music producer. A second channel for you playing. No, I, uh, I don't think that I will do a music channel because I'm too much of not a perfectionist, but I don't think my music skills are near up to the par of my photography skills at this point. So um, yeah, probably not gonna do that. I'll also show you while we're on this topic real quick, just cause it's in the room as well. This one isn't vintage. I obviously have a thing for uh, Gibson 
sunburst guitars. But this is my other guitar that I really love. My wife actually got this for me uh, for my birthday this year. And it is a Gibson Hummingbird Pro. Um, so it's like a more modern one. It has a pickup and everything like that. But there's just something about like classic Gibson and Fender guitars and classic cameras like these Leicas and my Hasselblad and stuff like that that I just am like so drawn to, um, which is why, you know, I just like love that whole thing, that whole vibe and everything like that. So very off topic, but uh, I do find those things to be very, very, I don't know, very inspiring. And there's something about having gear that is inspiring to use. And it's part of the reason why I just love like playing with all this stuff and trying out new cameras and uh, having stuff. I obviously, for me, this is a full-time job. Um, this is like what I do for a living. Um, and so I feel like I can justify much easier buying obviously expensive. Like I have uh, three, two Leica, three Leica lenses, including the older one, um, and two Leica M10s. Like the, it's just absurd. Like I would not have two Leica M10s if I didn't do this professionally. And for me, paying the extra money for the craftsmanship and the smaller form factor and the look and the uniqueness of it, and it's something that visually, when I look at it, I want to pick up and use it. If it's something that can keep me inspired to do the thing that I do for a living, like for me, that is something that's completely justifiable. Um, all of my money, even money I got from like, from like my grandma and stuff like that from my birthday and Christmas and stuff like that, all of it this year has gone just straight back into like, I spent money that I got for my birthday to buy this lens. Uh, and I spent money that I got for, you know, anything outside of photography. If I get like a gift, I buy film with it. I buy, I spend all my time doing this. So it's just something that I love to do and makes it easy to kind of justify all that kind of stuff. Um, I saw that someone, Tony, you mentioned something about um, the M10R. I've not tried it. Um, and it's not on my upgrade schedule. <laughs> so uh, I couldn't tell you, it's a different sensor. I've been told, or uh, I've heard maybe that it's based off of the Leica S3 architecture, which is their medium format camera, um, which gives better dynamic range, better low light performance. Um, and the color, I, I, I heard that the color is specifically in the red channel is improved and one of the things that is unique about Leica sensors is they have micro lenses in front of the sensor, which is why the wide angle lenses perform great on Leica cameras and they don't work on like an EOS R because of the way that light comes in through the lens. It's a totally like nerd subject that I could nerd out about, um, but most light comes straight through the lens and just hits the sensor and like it's, it's meant to do that on most cameras, but because of the distance on these tiny cameras and the mirrorless cameras and stuff like that. Um, light comes in and kind of comes in at weird angles and stuff like that out of Leica lenses. And so because of that, um, they have to have micro lenses to kind of redirect the light to the pixels correctly. And I guess, I could be wrong because I, I'm not, a, I'm just a, a nerd about this kind of stuff, but I heard that that's one of the things they also improved on the M10R, that wide, wide angle lenses like a 21 or something like that should perform better. Um, and oddly enough, if you want to, uh, to nerd out on a channel that actually looks exactly like mine, oops, I just spit a little bit, but it looks exactly like mine because they are in front of a black backdrop and they have a wood table like this and a bunch of cameras in front of them. Uh, there's a channel that's run by the people that, uh, run or own or whatever. I don't know the Leica store Miami. Uh, and they have a live show every Saturday or something like that called red dot camera talk. Uh, where they go live for like two hours about a very specific topic on here uh, about Leica cameras, whether it's, you know, wide angle lenses or a certain camera or whatever. Um, and I've just found that I've just put in an AirPod. I don't even know why I'm wearing this actually because I'm not, I don't have any sound coming through, but um, 
I just put that on and listen to it. I don't actually watch it, but I listen to it because I hear them talking about different lenses and, excuse me, characteristics of them and all that kind of stuff. So it's fun. So a lot of the little anecdotes uh, that I was talking about, even with like the sensor design and stuff like that, are coming from stuff I heard from them in their uh, YouTube show. So, um, yeah. <laughs> So if you want a really, really deep dive, like I think that I'm a nerd about Leica cameras, like you can deep dive much further with those guys. Um, so there are, there's probably like 12 plus hours worth of content on their channel um, from their live streams on that kind of stuff. So, uh, and everyone has always talked glowingly about Leica Store Miami. So, uh, and pro tip, Pro tip about Leica Store Miami right now, which I wasn't gonna say because I was gonna buy some more of it and maybe I need to do that before this live stream is over. They have Cine still. They have Cine still. They have Cine still for $12 a roll right now in 35 millimeter. I don't know if they have it in medium format, but that is significantly cheaper than anywhere else right now. So I bought like 10 rolls the other day and I probably need to buy more. So don't tell anybody, but the Leica Store Miami has Cinestill. And if you buy like 10 rolls, it's free shipping. So, uh, yeah. Cinestill is stupid expensive because it's Kodak Vision 3 that they've repurposed and removed the Remjet and all that stuff. Um, so, yeah. Someone asked, what color film do you shoot indoors with your family? Do you push? Uh, yeah. So, I shoot Portra 400 for almost everything. Um, and then I don't shoot a lot of color film indoors in the winter of my family. So I usually shoot that in the summer when there's a little more light coming into my house. I live in the Pacific Northwest where it's both dark earlier in the day uh, during the winter and cloudy and overcast and rainy. So I don't often, that's usually where I'm shooting uh, Tri-X push to stop or two. Um, so that's kind of like my go-to in that, in that realm. Um, uh, someone asked if you are covering up the Leica logos, why don't you just buy the M10P? Uh, yeah, so I don't care about the quieter shutter at, at all really. And I don't care about the touch screen. The touch screen would be cool, but the difference in price, even on the used market, uh, is like 1500 plus ish, depending on where you're buying it from and all that kind of stuff. And I definitely don't have, I, I whenever I buy a camera, ever since the 5D Mark II, because I used to shoot Canon, I have just decided that every time that I buy a new camera, I'm buying two of them. I'm not buying like one and then another one and then having mismatched sensors and having to deal with that on thousands of images from a wedding day. So anytime that I buy a new camera, it sucks, but I have to save up and buy two of them. So in that, Leicas are already stinking expensive enough as they are. And so, uh, I, yeah, I'm fully just like have to buy the cheapest model possible. Um, and yeah, I had a lot of questions in my Instagram as well about why I cover up the Leica logos. Uh, personally, I just find that I want to limit distractions from people. Um, and so, one of the things is that I photograph a ton of uh, other photographers' weddings. So my clients themselves are photographers. And so usually they kind of obviously know about like what cameras I'm photographing with. Um, but other people and stuff like that, I just want someone to be, I don't know, like when I pull this camera up to my face and take a photo, like it is just a black discrete box of nothing. Like it doesn't say anything on the top. It doesn't say anything anywhere really. Like it has, you know, like from the top, it says 35 millimeter and, you know, it's just like a black box that I take photos with. Um, and then my silver M10, is just a silver box that I take photos with that looks like a cheap camera that means nothing. Um, Dude, someone gave me a super chat for some coffee. Thank you. I forgot that I even had that turned on. But that, I really appreciate that. Thank you for that super chat thing there, Alex. Appreciate that. Uh, but anyway, so um, 
where was I? Talking about this. And so one of the reasons I cover up the logos is that I just want it to be just a super discreet black box or silver box or whatever that just doesn't say anything. And honestly, I would buy the P versions because I love the script on the top, but they're again, more expensive and I don't need to spend extra money on things that I don't need. I do, the person that I bought my M6 from put a black dot on there. And I would totally, if, if they, or if someone sold a black dot, I would do that instead of gaff tape because I am, I have a, you know, whatever, however many much these cameras are, $6,500 cameras that I'm putting black tape, black gaff tape over uh, the thing that's the logo. But I just find it's distracting um, and I don't want people to be fixated or trying to read what it says and stuff like that. And uh, a funny story that I shared on Twitter and maybe I shared it on Instagram as well, but um, when I was um, when I was photographing a wedding a couple months ago, Someone was, uh, before I had covered up the dot on one of my cameras, I don't remember which one, someone said, is your camera from the Food Network? Um, <laughs> just very, very random. But if you look at the Food Network logo, and then if you look at the Leica logo, they oddly look very similar. And so um, it's just another one of those things that like reminded me, this is why I cover this stuff up because People do try to figure out, like they're just intrigued by what's going on and they try to find out what's happening. And so I'm gonna try to see if I can find that tweet because I thought it was pretty funny. But anyway, the Leica logo and the Food Network logo oddly do look really, really similar. Uh, and I'm not gonna find it because it's too far. Anyway, um, so that's the reason I covered up. Um, and the reason that I have one of each color is because they just look cool and I've always wanted, I always wanted a silver one. Um, when I had the M10s, I had two black paint ones and I just love the idea of having one of each um, because if you're gonna buy two of them, if you have to buy two of them, you might as well buy one of each because they both look really cool. Um, and I think like pairing them with the, the lens color, like I bought all of these things like I'm into, I, I really love what this 50 uh, Sumalux looks like. I love the uh, red paint on it and the silver and how it just matches really well. I think that's really cool, um, just from like a nerdy perspective. And then I also love this 28 and how it looks, um, just kind of blacked out. But I actually didn't buy any of these because of the color of the lens itself. I just bought the thing that was available to me at the price that I could afford at the time. Um, Cause in all honesty, I would I would actually probably like this uh, Zeiss lens to be in black. I think that would probably make more sense. Um, but you know, you get like this kind of two-tone vibe from that, which can be cool. Um, and so, yeah. I think, I think that that is, I don't know. I think they look really cool. And so if I'm gonna buy two, might as well have both colors. Um, dun, 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 dun. Yeah, and I think I, I did the same thing going back and forth with the Fujifilm X100V as well, actually. Um, I couldn't figure out if I wanted a black one or a silver one. And as a camera that I was hoping my wife would use a little bit, which, Turns out she doesn't really want to use it because she just wants to use her iPhone, which whatever. Uh, I'll guess I just have to keep buying her the newest iPhone every time because I need good photos of myself. But um, she actually thought that the black version looked a little bit cheaper than this one. And so either way, I was gonna buy whichever one I could get for the right price and a silver one came up. So rock and roll. Dude, Kieran, I think is your name. Thank you so much. And you asked a question. Hey, that is a good way to get me to answer a question really easily. If you could only have one portrait lens for your M, which would you pick? Um, I pretty much shoot all of my portraits on my Leica system with the 50 millimeter. It's just long enough that you're not distorting things a lot and you're not, you're giving people a really good feel I also love taking environmental portraits. So you can take like a full body portrait of somebody with the 50 millimeter at 1.4 
and you can get that subject separation and you can get kind of the environment. And then up close-ish, uh, 50 millimeter looks really cool. I would say that, uh, you know, like a land is just weird and so everything's expensive there, but the 50 millimeter is basically what I photograph most of my portraits on. At 1.4, it looks incredible. Um, yeah, not much much else to say about it. I, I made, if you haven't watched it, I made a whole video specifically on how much I love that lens. And so, yeah, completely in love with that lens. I will say though, I didn't realize, uh, a random thing that I didn't realize was I bought the silver model which up until very recently, I think, was the brass model. So this is made of brass, which is much heavier than uh, the black paint or the black chrome or whatever version. Uh, so I do love that color. I kind of wish that I had a lighter version, uh, but I feel like there's such an emotional almost connection to this particular lens now that I don't think I can sell it or trade it for the other one. So um, anyway, yeah. Still trying to figure out between black and silver, what's the difference between M10 and M240? Um, so I talked a little bit about that going back, if you wanna hit back, and I think I'll try to go back and painstakingly make all these into you know questions that you can scroll through later on. Uh, and I'll make a specific video about um, the difference between the M10 and the M240. So um, yeah, we'll talk about that later. I will say a quick uh, thing that I can add. Brendan, you asked about the difference between the 50 Sonar and the TT Artisan 1.4. Um, they are completely separate lenses. So the Sonar was the first 50 I picked up. Um, this TT Artisan has a much more modern rendering. Um, it, it, it renders much more like the Sumalux than the Sonar does. The Sonar is, um, you can go research it if you want to. Um, the Sonar is a specific type of lens design that is, I think it might even be from like the 40s or 30s or something like that. So it is a very vintage design uh, in terms of just lens design. And one of the issues with it is it focus shifts. So if you're going to photograph on, um, you, you want to make sure that you figure out where your lens is calibrated to. So mine was calibrated to 1.5, which was great because I used it at 1.5, but photographing in between 1.5 and 5.6, it focus shift and back focused a ton. Um, so I could only shoot that lens at 1.5 and then I would have to stop all the way down to 5.6 to get it to be in focus again. Um, and I've found that that ends up being a big issue. So the issue with this lens, it doesn't focus shift from what I've seen out of it. And um, again, I made a big video about it if you haven't watched it, but I think honestly, I'm gonna keep this lens and shoot it on film a lot because it renders really, really well. And, um, but yeah, if you want like a more modern rendering, this renders a lot more modern. And then the sonar, I. The bokeh has what people would call character, uh, and I didn't like it. It was very sharp, and I loved how small it was, um, but I didn't like how it rendered, so I sold it. Um, someone asked, where is my M2? Um, and this is where my M2 went. I knew that I wanted to get a digital camera that my family could use, including my son and my wife and stuff like that. And I wanted to be able to just hand this camera to people at family events because I want to personally exist in my family's history. So if you watch my Fujifilm X100V video, uh, I talk about how I sold my M2, which was like such a hard thing for me to do. Uh, I sold that to buy the X100V. Uh, I still have an M6, so it's not like I don't have a digital or a film like a, um, but I just wasn't using it enough to justify. And I needed, I felt like for my own visual history, I needed a digital camera that I could send off, you know, hand to people and they could use it, uh, which this has ended up being great for that. 
and it's a great for a backup and I have uh, the filter attachment for it so I can use it in all weather, all that kind of stuff. So um, I think it's been worthwhile, but yeah, my heart kind of like hurts that I don't have that camera anymore a little bit, but oh well, gotta do what you gotta do. Can't afford everything. <laughs> um, so I have a, a quick thing about calibration. Um, I try not to buy any lenses that focus shift at different apertures. Just is an issue that I don't want to deal with. The Leicas have always been great for me. I've had no issues with that. The Zeiss has been great with me. I have no issues with that. Um, but then all these TT Artisan and 7 Artisan lenses, you just have to calibrate them yourself. Um, and I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if the 75 millimeter focus shifts or not. It's just so hard to tell what's in focus and what's not in focus on this lens because it's so soft uh, at 1.4. So yeah, who knows? Um, I feel like the, the the M film body still have a better quality than the digital M. Uh, people talk down on the M6 a lot in comparison to the M2 because this is made of, I don't know, zinc or something weird like that instead of uh, brass, like the M2s. I feel like the M10 and the M6 are completely comparable in terms of build quality. Like maybe the M10 body is probably thinner than the M6, but that's because they don't, they don't have to shove electronics and stuff like that in the M6. Um, so... I feel like they're made really, really similar. Like um, the materials seem to be similar. Everything seems to be really, really similar. And so I don't really see a giant difference in that. I'll say that I've used, you know, I owned an M2 for a long time and the camera that felt the most amazing to me out of any camera I've ever used, um, and it just felt like pure perfection, mechanical perfection was the Leica MA. So it's their, one of their new cameras uh, that, you know, has, it's like a new film camera, but it's like $5,000 or something like that. It doesn't have a light meter. It's basically like an M2, M3 combo perfected new. That thing just felt like pure mechanical perfection, like I said, but uh, yeah, I don't have the money to use one of those long-term for sure. And I enjoy a light meter, so. So yeah, there's definitely a difference between that camera and these cameras, but um, for me, the difference between in price was you know the difference between having a Sumalux or not. So it wasn't really worth it for me because I don't have that kind of money. Um, let's see. Uh, I had a ton, a ton, a ton of um, questions about this um, on my Instagram and I always get questions about it. Like why don't I own an M2 or not an M2, but a Q or a Q2. Um, so the Q and the Q2 seem like really cool cameras. The lens on it is amazing. I shoot so much hybrid stuff though, that I really wanted a 28 millimeter lens that worked both on film and digital. Um, and I, the reason that I shoot with the M bodies is for specifically for like wider lenses shooting the, my, my use case always is photographing a couple that is less than a third of the frame in a forest wide open because it's dark, um, you know, and being able to focus on them is really easy on a rangefinder. And I find that on most digital cameras, it can't pick out the depth difference because it's not quite infinity. Um, and so it's it's hard for that to, to work out. And I find that the rangefinder works for me. So in saying that, that's the reason I don't have a Q or a Q2. So that's like reason number one. Reason number two is because I really wanted a high quality 28 millimeter lens and I wanted to be able to use it on digital and film. So that's why I spent more money than buying a used Q to buy just the lens for this. The other thing about it is, oops, I just kicked the camera, but 
Uh, the other thing about it is that with Leica, um, things that aren't reliant on digital technology, for the most part, either retain their value or rise in value. Um, and so like my M6 is worth at least a thousand dollars more than what I paid for it. My Sumalux is probably worth about 800 at least ish dollars than what I paid for it. And then I just got the Sumacron. So even if I sell it at the price that I paid for it in a couple years, I was basically renting it for free. Um, so that's kind of the, the rationale behind um, the reason I don't have a queue. If I was only doing things personally and didn't need two digital bodies, maybe. Um, it would definitely replace you know, the X100V. But that was kind of like my workaround, right? It's like having the smaller than a hue kind of point and shoot-ish vibe with the X100V, but then also being able to have the 28. It's kind of like being able to like have my cake and eat it too or whatever that phrase is. Um, that was kind of like my rationale behind, I mean, between buying these two things, it was over $4,000. So definitely not cheap, but still cheaper than buying a Q2. Um, and so anyway, it's just stinking expensive no matter how you do it, right? But that's kind of my rationale. Um, I did have a lot of questions about this, Alan, as well. Um, how do I find shooting an M10 with 28 millimeters with glasses? So with glasses, if I pull this up to my eye, I gotta turn it on. That is one of the things that, I, it's kind of a bummer too, it takes like a, a second-ish to load. But if I turn this up to my eye, I can't see. I have to move my eye around the viewfinder a little bit with glasses on to see the full 28 millimeter frame lines. Um, and if I stick my eye all the way in, I still can't see all of it. Um, and so, you know, I just kind of, it's one of those things where I kind of just get used to what, this is a total cop out and like, uh, I don't know. It's just it's just a thing that I do and like it's just part of like my appreciation for old school nature of things. I just kind of memorize what focal lengths are. So, I don't actually I have it in another bag, but I have that 20 21 millimeter Voigtlander and I just shoot that thing. Oh, dude, Ryan Landis. Uh, I've known you for forever. Good to see you. Thanks. Goodbye. <laughs> um, but I shoot that 21 millimeter just, I just know what it looks like. I know that it's about this wide. Like, um, and so I don't use a, a viewfinder for it. Oh, and who are these people giving me thumbs down in this? I'm providing a free service here, come on. Um, so yeah, and if you, wanna, if you wanna be nice, you can give me a thumbs up in the, in the thing here. Subscribe if you haven't already, all those good things. Uh, because if I can do more of this kind of stuff in the future, I would love to do it. I think this stuff's super fun. Talking cameras, it's what I like to do. So anyway, uh, I basically just memorize where these focal lengths are in my brain. So it's a, a total not great thing, but even like this, <laughs> this is the Fujifilm Class W and you know, like everything's really imprecise about it. Um, and so I'm not really worried about it. I kind of just have a very good idea of what the framing looks like and stuff like that. And um, the M10 viewfinder is a little bit bigger. So you can see most of it. I feel like I have a good idea of what that kind of thing is. And I don't really feel like I need to use an EVF or an OVF for those lenses specifically. Um, but yeah, like people are, are saying, I do think that like the dream would be to have like, a set of MPs or M6s with like a point, point five eight uh, for like the wide angle and then a point eight five for like the 50. I think that would be obviously super fun, but is what it is. I'm totally fine with it. Uh, I've just been doing it for a couple years and I kind of just get used to it. So, um, dude, thanks guys. Thanks for saying nice things. Um, do you split range finder focuses? Okay, so someone did talk about um, someone said something about photographing Fujifilm stuff. Uh, 
I do think that, like I, I mentioned it earlier, I do think that the sensor has enough dynamic range. Uh, it shoots well enough in low light. And this lens in particular on the X100V is up to professional quality. So dynamic range, low light performance, and lens sharpness are in like focus reliability, that kind of stuff. Uh, I feel like those things are what most matters. You know, reliability, all that kind of stuff. If the X100V, this is going to be a cop out because none of my lens, none of my cameras have dual card slots. But if the X100V had dual card slots, it would be a professional camera. And honestly, I shoot multiple cameras and I double up everything. My way around having dual card slots on my cameras, which it is a bummer to have a, I think these things new are like $8,000 and they don't have dual card slots. I understand because they're tiny and I don't even know where you would fit two, two card slots in this body. Um, and if you want to go look at the, they may have like a making of the M10 and it's fascinating to see how all the electronics fit into these tiny bodies. Um, but for all the major moments at weddings and all of the family portraits, I take two different angles of everything. So if I lost an entire side of a wedding, uh, it would suck, definitely. But I would still have all the major moments documented on one of the focal lengths. Um, so it is what it is. Uh, it's kind of the price you pay. But it's the same thing like with if you shot film, um, you know, you're... You have more reliability possibility issues with shooting film uh, than you do on digital, even with a single. So knock on wood, I've never had it happen yet where something corrupted where I couldn't recover it. But yep, is what it is. That's my kind of workaround. And I actually did a video uh, early on before I was like taking YouTube seriously at all um, that talked about how I um, photograph two moments at once and so the way I do it as well is I have my wide angle is always on this side and then my telephotos on this side and then I photograph with my pinky on this side and I photograph major moments like this. So click, 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 click. And that's what I do. It's super wacky. Um, there's no sound. JK, okay, cool, just making sure. I was having audio issues early on, on in this thing, so it's my, my new thing. I do have a microphone right here off camera, so hopefully it's working out. Um, but that's kind of my workaround, and I know that I can buy an SL, SL2, all that kind of stuff, um, but th it's, then it's not an M, and that's like what draws me to Leica more than the brand. I think the SL2S seems really cool, and the idea of being able to shoot my M lenses on that body better because I can only use lenses longer than 50 millimeters on my R, my Canon EOS R. Um, so, but otherwise, like that that system, uh, you know, I could buy two Canon R6s for the price of one uh, Leica SL2S. And so it kind of, and it kind of does mostly the same thing where this, there is like no, there's nothing, nothing on the market at all that does what a digital M does. Like there's literally nothing, nothing you can do to get a coincident rangefinder that's digital other than buying a Leica M. So kind of my only, my only option at this point. So that's the reason behind it. Um, and yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a lot about it. I will say, um, there is a rumor that Leica might be releasing a cheaper than MP film camera. Uh, if it has a meter, if it's basically like an updated M6 with a meter for three grand or less, I, I will probably find a way to buy one. If it's more money than that, and all that kind of stuff, then like, I don't know. But I think that Leica, if I was Leica, I'd be seeing how much used M6s are going for right now and just go, yeah, we could make one that's profitable at $3,000 or $3,500 or whatever, easy, um, and people would buy them. So I love the idea that, that they might be doing that. So that would be pretty awesome. 
I do hope that they uh, make a new film camera that is semi-affordable in 2020 or 2021, and I will continue to lust after the MP because that's the camera I, you know, if I won the lottery or something like that, that's what I would do. Um, a bunch of questions, and I got a bunch of questions on my videos about the X100V about JPEGs. Um, I've been dialing in and shooting everything on black and white on the JPEG settings, um, but I haven't gotten into the Fuji Raw, whatever that thing is, uh, their software. Um, so I haven't dialed in my um, recipes yet. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. Um, but yeah, I think it'd be fun to dial in a recipe and see, I just, I, I need to pull up that, uh, Fuji has like a raw recipe maker or something. I don't know. Paul Von Reiter, Paul Reeder, whatever that guy's last name is, uh, was telling me about how I need to do it and how I need to dial in my own recipe stuff on there. So, and yeah, basically anything that is film, higher end film stuff is like double in price right now. Uh, which is awesome. Kodak's doing well from what I'm hearing. Uh, I wish that they wouldn't continue to raise their prices on film because paying, I don't know, like almost $10 or whatever it is for a roll of Portrait 400 now is getting crazy. Man, like, it's just super frustrating. I used to shoot, I think I have some in here. For a while, I was getting this Kodak Color Plus. Whoa, that looks crazy with the LUT. Um, I was shooting this Kodak Color Plus um, it was my favorite budget film for a long time, and I was getting this on Amazon in a 10-pack for $27.99. A 10-pack of 36 exposure Kodak Color Plus, so I was getting it for $2.80 a roll. And stinking, now this stuff is like four something, four fifty dollars a roll or something like that. Um, and even that, it's always sold out. Also, my favorite budget film. If you're looking for a budget film, man, that is crazy. I've never looked at what this LUT does to red colors, but that makes it like almost fluorescent-y on here. Um, anyway, this is my favorite budget film. So if you're looking for a film and you can get this in 36 exposures, um, it doesn't have the dynamic range or the clean look that Portrait 400 has, but it is by far my favorite non-professional film. It's what I shoot mostly on all my point and shoots and stuff. Um, and you know, like, I've never liked Superior or C200. Um, just, just not what I, not, not being something I liked. I don't, I never liked the green-ish like stuff to it and it felt cooler. I like that kind of like warmer classic Kodak vibe um that especially color plus gives me so boom all right i'm gonna try to get back to some of these questions because here we go i have barely answered any of these questions because i've been paying way more attention to the chat which thank you guys for being fairly active in this chat it's been really fun um let's see i'm gonna try to grab one from instagram that i haven't actually gotten should I sell my Leica Q and get an M240? If you want a focal length other than 28 millimeters and you want a rangefinder, yes, buy an M240. I think it's a great camera. You can watch my M240 video. And for 90% of the work that I did and do as a wedding photographer, the M240 does just as good a job as the M10 for $2,000 less. Um, <clears throat> lots of questions about focusing with the rangefinder. I'll have to do that again sometime, but you can go back in this um, video and I talk about it at some point and I'll put chapter markers, anybody that's watching this later on. Um, boom, boom, boom. Okay, biggest tips for X100V, you'll have to wait for that video. I'll, I'm trying to kind of compile all that stuff as I've been shooting that camera a ton lately. Uh, 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 um, someone did, I had a couple people asking about mentorships. Um, I do have a page on my website that I can actually toss on here. 
um, which will be funny because people will be probably getting this before it actually goes onto <laughs> the, the actual chat because of the time delay. But I'll t toss this in the thing. If anybody wants a mentor session from me, that's the link. I don't know if it'll actually pull up, but um, a lot of interest in like one-on-one -on -one sessions. Um, I do a ton of those and I've done a ton of those in the past where I can like break down your portfolio, talk about things where you can improve, help you with marketing, that kind of stuff um, in a one-on-one -on -one situation. Um, and I actually did get a lot of questions about that on here because I haven't been uh, talking about that nearly as much. Um, <clears throat> one of, okay, this is a, a good one for right now. What's one of the biggest highlights of your photography career so far? So anytime I get to the end of the year and I've paid my bills through photography, highlight, for sure. Um, other highlights along the way this year, surviving and uh, barely photographing anything and still paying my bills, uh, mainly if we're honest, uh, because of presets. So anybody that has uh, bought my presets over the years or especially this year, uh, I think that I probably made more money on presets this year than I did doing anything else specifically. It's the, been the most consistent uh, source of income for me. So anybody that bought my presets, thank you very, very much. It has literally been the thing that has kept me from having to get some other job or gonna go on unemployment. Um, so hopefully that will not be an issue going into next year because hopefully all of my weddings that postponed from this year to next year will just still happen. And hopefully everyone can get the vaccine, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so honestly, having something and a digital product and something that is outside of the realm of just the single basket of wedding photography to pay my bills this year, um, even though I made way less money than I did the year before, um, Having that is a big accomplishment. I feel like that's been one of the, the biggest things in my career that I've been sort of proud of um, was having something like that. Um, so I think highlights have been, uh, one of the biggest random highlights was I photographed the NFC Championship game in 2013 uh, for the Seattle Seahawks when we won and went to the Super Bowl. That was super fun. I uh, don't really do that anymore, but I would love to if anybody knows anybody at the Seahawks that wants to talk to their digital department again and have me shoot um, sideline stuff. That was super, super fun. Um, and I'm trying to think. I think when I hit, when I got featured on Instagram as like a suggested user and I gained, I think I gained like 80,000 followers in two weeks or something like that. That was pretty cool. Um, I think the first, the first time that I made like my business grossed more than a hundred thousand dollars in a year from people just paying me to take their photos. That was a huge thing. I remember specifically the first time that someone paid me $2,000 to photograph a wedding. I was like, I've made it. This is the end game. I'm like, I'm here. I'm in it to win it. And uh, it was mainly just because I, I thought like, there's no way that I could be an artist for a living. And I've been mostly doing this and just general artsy kind of things since I graduated from college easily. And mostly since I was about 20, I've been doing music and video stuff and early on video stuff and now photography and stuff. And it's the only real job I've ever had was doing this kind of stuff. So having that is a simple accomplishment and that's kind of been the biggest highlight. But I think traveling, especially my wife and I, I think the coolest gig we ever did was my wife and I um, photographed a multi-day wedding in Kenya for an Indian couple over Christmas one year. So we spent Christmas in Nairobi and did a bunch of wedding stuff um, and we like FaceTimed our family on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day and stuff. Um, but we got to like obviously go to Kenya and, and go see the Maasai Mara and, and all that kind of stuff. And obviously doing that kind of stuff, traveling, uh, done weddings multiple times in Australia, got to speak in Australia, got to visit New Zealand, 
have been to Europe plenty of times because of this. Uh, I've done two weddings in Kenya now, did an elopement in Turkey and Istanbul, um, you know, a bunch of stuff in Mexico and Canada and uh, the Caribbean. Hawaii is always like a huge highlight. So um, yeah, I would say those are all, all big highlights. I always love to travel. And I always wanted to do something like this. So just the idea that I've been able to do this for a decade plus uh, is super cool and something that I've, I've been super thankful to do. Um, every year I'm just super thankful that people want to pay me money to do things that I love to do and it affords me to have a family now and pay a mortgage and still be able to buy fun things like all of this stuff that's surrounding me right now. <laughs> like I think I have, I don't know, probably like 20 some cameras in this office at least. Uh, and I love cameras, obviously. So, <clears throat> another question. So, Jessica Livak or Levak or something like that. I don't even know if you're watching this stream, but you asked me like 10, let's see here, four really good questions. And I think that I have answered all of them now, if when I will answer this one. Uh, how do you see wedding photography evolving in 10 to 20 years? Um, and I don't know if this will be the case, but as we are more and more reliant on social media and just digital media and stuff like that in general, I think the number one thing that I can tell people outside just being a good business person, if you're good at business, like you could, you're gonna be able to make things work, but from a creative perspective, the number one advice I could give to photographers right now is to learn how to make good video. I think that as we move further and further into like reels and video content being more and more the norm, whether or not we are going to need to learn how to do video, um, I think it's gonna be more and more prominent as things go on. And if you are a photographer and you can learn things about LUTs and shutter angles and uh, you know frame rates and uh, codecs and all that kind of stuff, um, I think that's gonna be really, really helpful for people moving on. So um, I'm gonna do a video on the things that I've learned about video uh, on my Patreon. So if you even go back to my videos that I did at the beginning of this year, some of it I was obviously gonna do with gear. And obviously the other thing is audio. Audio is the thing that most people with video get wrong. Uh, so I'm gonna need to do a ton of work to figure out all that kind of stuff. But uh, if you go back and look at the videos that are early on in my channel, they are so poor quality. And it's because everyone was just saying like, the idea is the thing that matters, like no one cares about quality. Uh, but turns out when you're doing <laughs> videos, talking to visual creatives about photography, people definitely care about your video quality. So um, learning about that kind of stuff, um, I think is gonna be really, really helpful. So learning about lighting, learning about audio. Uh, and for me, one of the things that like I can't unsee now is the 180 degree shutter rule. So the idea that motion looks correct and looks to the right perspective and stuff like that. Um, so when someone's just over cranking their shutter and not using ND filters and stuff like that at weddings now, oh, it like bothers me so much to watch wedding films uh, that you know they're clearly just shooting their their shutter speed at like one four thousandth of a second. And everything's kind of jittery and choppy. So if you want to know, that's the thing in my limited video knowledge and experience. Having a slow shutter speed that's double your frame rate. So I'm shooting at twenty four frames per second. I have my uh, shutter speed at one fiftieth of a second, which is basically double. Is the thing that makes my motion and every time I move something look natural and um, not jittery. So if you're shooting jittery footage, that's one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons why. So I think in the next 10 to 20 years, video will play more of a part and the idea of figuring out multimedia and how to present your work in those ways, I think are gonna be more and more important. I still think there's gonna be, the need for classic photography is gonna be there, but I think that video is gonna continue to be more and more of a thing moving forward. So an easy creative future proof you can do since most cameras other than these ones do good video now is to learn about video if you are a photographer if you don't already know much about it and man 
My lips are getting dry. My throat is getting dry. I've been on here for an hour and 45 minutes now. Sheesh. Has anybody been on here this whole time? Because that would be kind of amazing. Um, also, I, I mentioned it earlier, but if you guys are on Clubhouse, um, maybe I'll make a room or something like that. Or I don't even know exactly how that all works. But I do find that app was really interesting. And I think if you find the right ones, listening to that whole thing uh, can be really cool. It felt like a live podcast in a way that was interactive. Um, so mine's just like bench hype, like it is on any other social media platform. So if you want to go like follow me on there, uh, I'm going to try to maybe I'll make a room with some people. That's kind of fun. I thought I thought it was really cool listening in on a couple last night. Um, but I do want to find more of them. Let's see. <clears throat> a lot of people, as I've gotten a... <laughs> Dude, thanks for that Mia 7-2 pitch in. Uh, it's, that's like one of my white whale cameras. My white whale cameras, again, are Pentax 672, the Mamiya 7 or Mamiya 72, and then the Hasselblad X-Pan. I'm like sort of obsessed with all those cameras and have never owned any of them. Um, and every time I want to buy one, like I had the money because I spent $3,000 on this stupid 28 millimeter lens that I do love. I could 100% have bought a Mamiya 7 with a lens, but I just went like, what is your actual job? What's gonna make you money? And it's this. So, um, but I have been getting a ton of questions about the Fujifilm X100V and specifically the X Pro 3. I don't own an X-Pro3. If someone wants to hook me up with a channel sponsor or some way to get an X-Pro3 in my hands, uh, I would love to do one. I find those cameras to be really fascinating and I love the um, OVF with the tiny, tiny, tiny EVF in there. It has the same thing that the X100V does. And I think it might have a bigger viewfinder. I do wish that it had, from what I've seen, it doesn't have a big enough OVF to shoot an 18 mil, which is their 28 mil equivalent. So that's a bummer for me because I really do love that 28 millimeter. Um, I, yes, I do drink coffee. I drink way too much coffee and I've been on a cold brew kick pretty much all year now. So I've been drinking iced coffee and cold brew with like a tiny bit of like, um, just like flavored creamer, just like a tiny bit to cut it down a little bit. So I'm not like a, a coffee purist by any means, even though I you know, live in coffee land where everyone is obsessed. <clears throat> but yeah, team, uh, if you guys have any questions or anything like that, feel free to drop them in the chat. Uh, I have a few more, a ton of people have just asked the same questions. Um, so I can, I'll answer this one because I have this kind of stuff in front of me. How do you determine if you will shoot film or digital for your personal stuff? Um, I do get that question a lot and there's a bunch of that same question in these um, questions in general. <clears throat> for personal stuff, for a long time, for the last like three-ish years, I was only shooting film. So I love the idea of not seeing anything on the back, um, taking the photo and then getting it back a month or so later because that's kind of like my schedule. I usually send out my film just once a month. Um, but with having, oh my, I went out of focus a little bit. There we go. But with um, picking this up because I really wanted um, my wife to have a camera that, it, that she could use and now my son, you know, if you guys watched that video that my son and I made, it's brilliant. This camera and this system is brilliant and I love, um, yeah, love that camera and that combo and stuff like that. Um, so right now, one of the things that I'm doing because of this YouTube channel is I'm shooting, I'm just trying out all of these different, um, I'm pretty much photographing most of the, the newer and more intriguing Seven Artisan and TT Artisan lenses. So I filmed a review video on the TT Artisan 35. I've done a, a video on the Seven Artisan 35 1.4 uh, with the 75 and with the, the 50. I already have a video on this one. I filmed one for this one. 
Um, so right now, all my personal work, which is really fun for me, uh, is being photographed on digital because I'm having, I just wanna grow this YouTube channel and answer questions that I have about this gear and stuff. So um, I'm not getting paid to do any of these videos and some of them I'm not even getting any loaner gear for, but um, I'm just making those videos. And so I'm uh, my sample images have just been, since I'm in mostly lockdown-y, quarantine-y stuff, um, have been just me photographing my family and stuff on those and kind of giving my perspective that way. So that's kind of what I've been doing. But for the most part, over the years, all of my personal stuff has been on film. Uh, and if you guys have watched like my, I did a video, one of my first videos uh, when I was in Warsaw speaking at a conference there, uh, I shot with the Hasselblad and my M6 and just did, did a bunch of kind of like street travel stuff on that. And then I have, um, <clears throat> let me know if you guys are interested in this. I've, I'm planning on making some videos surrounding it, but um, I've just done a ton of traveling and stuff like that over the years and made some really cool photos. So I thought about doing uh, a kind of like breakdown of my photographs from Iceland on my M9 back in the day. Cause I, it was, a big regret was not bringing a film camera. But then I shot my M6 and my Hasselblad in Norway and took a ton, like, a ton of amazing photos. Same with Santorini. I photographed, I think I had an M7 that I was borrowing from Leica at the time. And then my Contax T2. Um, I've gone there a couple times. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, like I, I thought about doing kind of breakdown videos of those things and I thought it'd be fun to do, um, especially since I can't travel right now. Um, and I would normally be doing those kind of videos and lots of videos to Yosemite and stuff like that. So all of that kind of personal travel stuff, when I'm going out to just make photos for fun of my travels, it's always on film. I feel like that experience of shooting things on film uh, is just always what I do. And then 95% of my paid wedding work um, has always been on uh, digital. It's where... I just found that workflow makes the most sense. And then I bring whatever camera at the moment either inspires me or uh, I feel like fits the wedding the best. So sometimes I'll just shoot uh, the Hasselblad on Tri-X and sometimes I'll shoot the Hasselblad on something else. And sometimes I have that Roloflex that I'll shoot. Uh, I did an elopement in downtown Seattle um, on someone just asked about the class W I, when I first got it, like a couple weeks in, I brought the class W and just shot black and white, uh, pushed, I pushed it to stop and just shot this on auto for the entire elopement and just thought that would be a fun camera to use. Um, so for my film work at weddings, it just kind of depends on what I want to do. Um, and so usually it's the M6 because it's just the easiest, it's high quality, it fits the system. So usually I have the hold fast strap with a camera on each side. Um, and then I have the M6 around my neck and then it makes swapping the lenses between all that stuff just super, super easy. Um, and yes, those who are, are talking, I, I popped into like a live stream of someone else the other day. I think it was Samuel Street Life, his channel. Um, and a bunch of people were talking about how I was the reason that they're, that they're shooting Leica cameras. Um, and uh, cause I'm basically like, I think I might be the only one or close to the only one that only shoots Leica rangefinders at weddings. I, I don't shoot with the Q or the SL2 or any of the other Leica stuff. I just shoot with the rangefinders. Um, and so, um, yeah, I've, <laughs> and I don't know, maybe it's just because this is a live stream or whatever. I've tried really hard. Like I've bothered Leica. I sent them emails and talked to them. They've lent me cameras over the years. Um, and I legitimately really wanted to be sponsored by Leica for a long time. So I did my best. Uh, I would love it if they would consider partnering with me in some way, even sending me loaner gear every once in a while or letting me borrow stuff for review uh, sending me new stuff to review. But again, I have short of 16,000 subs on YouTube, which is uh, pretty puny in the YouTube world. So I don't think I have a lot of clout 
in the YouTube world in that way. Um, and that's where these review videos and stuff like that are mostly going. So who knows? I would honestly love it if I could get some sort of relationship with them uh, in some sort of meaningful way that they would send me loaner gear because uh, that ties into Will uh, asked, if you had the money, what would your next Leica lens be? Um, if I had the money, like I would get the 75 Sumo Lux, 75 Noctilux, uh, or actually, no, I would get the 90 Sumo, Sumo Lux. That's like the F1.4, I think. Or the 28 Sumalux, gosh, I could get all sorts of things. If I had the money, I would buy the M10 monochrome because I think that uh, having that for, I've even tried to justify that camera in my mind because I shoot in such low light environments at times where even the M10s aren't good enough. And having the lack of a color filter array on that camera makes it so you can shoot at like insanely high. I remember I borrowed, Leica sent me, uh, to try for like two weeks. I had the M246 or 262 or whatever the, the M240 monochrome version was. I had that camera and the Sumalux for a couple weeks, the 35 Sumalux. And I remember I was shooting that camera at like ISO 25,000 and it was awesome. So, um, yeah, I would love, 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 love to have the m10 monochrome i think that would be super fun so if anybody wants to bother leica and tell them to sponsor me or something like that that would be great because that's one of the endeavors that i have not been able to succeed at uh and I, maybe they just don't uh, maybe they don't uh want to work with someone like me i don't know i think they they seem to go after more of like the uh like celebrity crowd and influencers and stuff like that. Um, but regardless, I'm just gonna be the person that uh, spends a ton of money on their stuff and generally promotes the crap out of them anyway. Because that's just what I like to do and that's what I love. And it's not like I'm Gibson's paying me to play their guitars. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's that's my kind of like two cents on, uh, on Leica and my relationship or lack thereof with them. Uh, yeah, I've talked to them over the years and stuff like that, and that would be great. Um, and I've even had, I don't know if I should say this, I've had other camera brands essentially offer to sponsor me, and then I've just I've just said, like, no, I, I love shooting these, and so I'm going to keep doing it. And I've tried to then <laughs> use, you know when Dwight on The Office uh, gets, like, the fake uh, offer from another paper company from Jim, or I think it, that was him. Yeah, they like fake. Anyway, I tried to say, you know, when he walks into Michael's office and goes, this is called leveraging an offer. And then he goes in and like tells them that he's got a better offer with better pay at Cumberland Mills. And I've even tried to just like tell like, I like, hey, I like love your cameras so much. And I use them and I promote them and everything like that without getting anything. And I've had other companies offer me to send them me their gear <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I really want to do things with you and still nothing, but it's okay. I, I will continue to shoot with the stuff that I love. Whew. And yeah, Lucas, I would love to do a video with him. Love that guy. And now that he's in Portland, we're pretty close. And yeah, someone asked about the, uh, Oppo or Apo or whatever, Sumicron 50. <clears throat> I think that's like a $7,500 lens or something. Uh, so that would require a, uh, like a relationship or sponsorship or something like that, because there is no way that I can afford to buy a $7,000 50 millimeter lens, but I would love to, I hear great things about it. And I was listening to someone talk about how, uh, this is how much of a nerd I am. I know the lens designer's name for Leica, his name's Peter Carber or Carba or something like that. Um, and I was listening to an interview where he was talking about how that is like the most perfect Leica lens. It's a lens that um, he designed, I think when he was building or designing the 50 Sumalux and the amount of precision in the optics and everything like that was so intense that he just thought that Leica wouldn't go for it. The fact that you had to pay like $7,000 for a 50 millimeter that's slower, that's an F2. But I guess he convinced them and they made it and now that lens is like sold out everywhere and everyone loves it. 
Uh, but I guess I was told or I heard maybe I don't remember what it was, but that there's that there's only one person at Leica that can put that lens together. Um, and so, yeah, that lens sounds incredible. And especially there, they make a black chrome special like Leica LS, LHSA edition. Um, and that thing just looks like unbelievably cool. If they made it in black paint, that would be like the ultimate. <clears throat> But yeah, as you can tell, I'm a bit of a nerd about Leica stuff. Um, I'm definitely into it. Someone asked a little bit ago, and I'm so sorry for like sort of missing your question. Um, and I'm trying to get it. Nigel, um, you asked about, did you consider the Voigtlander 28 millimeter? Yes, I did. Uh, I've even made a quick comparison video uh, about, yes, so Bill, the 50 Lux is 10 years older than the 50 Oppo, but from the story that I heard and hearing him talk about it, he came up with the design for the Oppo at around the same time, but he couldn't. He didn't convince Leica, he just kept it in his archives or whatever and didn't convince Leica to actually make the lens until about 10 years later. Um, but the 28 millimeter Ultron, I made a quick comparison video between this and the Summicron. The too long didn't read version. If you want to shoot this on film and you don't care about corner sharpness, this is great. If you care about corner sharpness, wide open, this lens is it like gets that smearing effect. Um, so, yep, that's why I upgraded because I pushed my light let lenses to the limit at um, the weddings and elopements and stuff like that that I do. So that's why I bought the Summicron, um, and yeah. If I was only shooting it on film uh, for personal stuff, I would have kept it, but I moved up. Yes, and I've also heard that the 50 Lux is an oppo as well. Um, sort of unconfirmed for me, but I've heard that's why it's so incredible at um, resisting chromatic aberration and, and stuff like that. Um, so, dude, shout out to Bill. As Bill Daniels, you seem to know a lot about Leica stuff as well. Um, so yeah, I love that lens and I've got a ton of comments in my 50 Lux video about it being an oppo lens. Um, <laughs> yes, I am doing a, a full X100 review video. It's probably gonna come in the next few weeks. Um, at this point, I think I have six videos that I have filmed and edited and they're actually in my YouTube queue. Um, and then another maybe four or so that I haven't edited, but I filmed. Um, and I need to do a video on my M10 still. I need to do a comparison between the M10 and the M240. I need to do the Fujifilm X100V review. Um, and then Let's see, what other things that I still need to film? I need to film a video about, I'm gonna do a video about uh, photographing in the snow. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna do, and then I have a ton of, it's just like, since I'm not shooting anything, I'm just making videos for YouTube and Patreon. So I have a bunch of videos on Patreon as well. So if you wanna hear me nerd out about composition and editing and all that kind of stuff, uh, I've been doing a ton of stuff on Patreon as well. And I just did a video that I published yesterday uh, where I went and broke down my best of 2010 photos and talked about like where my photos have differed and where they still are, which has been super interesting. Oh, sweet. So uh, Mr. Peter Carba mentioned it in an interview. That's awesome. Um, Yes, I'm doing a video on the 28 Cron for sure. I did a video that I filmed already but haven't edited uh, just as like a first impressions. You know, I probably shot maybe 100 or so photos on the 28 Cron to compare it to the Voigtlander. And in my initial testing, uh, it's definitely has been worth and the, the rationale behind me getting the 28 Cron has made sense. Um, but yeah, I'll do a video specifically about it. Um, but it's one of those things that like, I don't know. It's a it's a weird it's a weird dynamic about YouTube and making such incredibly niche topics. Like 
I'm trying to answer the questions that I have because no one's answering those questions for me. But there's a reason why those, no one's answering those questions for me because they're not that much, like there's not that much demand for those questions, right? Uh, so that's the weird thing about doing YouTube because honestly, like if there wasn't a pandemic and I had normal work to do, there's no way I could justify doing this YouTube channel and doing this kind of stuff. And honestly, I can't really justify doing this YouTube channel anyway because it's not really making me any money <laughs> of any substance at this point. Uh, but I do hope that it will at some point. Uh, but I'm you know, not that great of a video editor and these videos do take me a lot of time. And so um, <clears throat> choosing what videos to do and not do at some point is gonna end up being based on like views and what videos I think will do good and be successful and that's gonna be kind of an annoying thing. But right now I'm doing a bunch of videos, again, like who knows how many people are gonna really care about the difference between the 28 Sumicron and the Voigtlander 28. But I'm just trying to make videos that I, I find are interesting and would be helpful to me. Um, and at some point, maybe I'll be having to make videos about the Canon R5 or something. <laughs> or it just won't make sense, or maybe I'll be making one video a month or something like that instead of uh, all the videos I'm making now. But the more people that watch these videos, and this is a stupid plug, but that's why I ask people to subscribe and stuff like that. If um, you know people like and subscribe and share these videos and stuff like that, then they'll do better and then I'll have more opportunity possibly for channel sponsors or whatever. And I like doing this, but at some point, if this thing doesn't grow, in all honesty, like I'm not gonna be able to do it anymore because it's just too much work for not enough actual financial gain, right? And that's why people have to do things. So um, anyway, I'll jump back in here too. Yeah, I've probably had like a ridiculous, I've probably had 50 people say that they've bought Leica stuff because of me. So I should have got on some sort of affiliate network at least, made some money off that. Um, what's my favorite black and white film stock? I love shooting Tri-X. I've loved the grittiness of it. Uh, Father Matt Day told me to shoot HP5 and I shot some of it and was like, eh, it's okay. I, wasn't, I just wasn't that much of a fan of it. Uh, but maybe I exposed it differently or wrong or something like that, so. Who knows? Um, yeah, so that's my, my kind of thing. I have a lot of P3200 black and white film as well. Uh, when I did that, um, when I did that video of Ektachrome with Kodak, they didn't pay me, but um, they told me that I could get, I think it was a hundred rolls of whatever I wanted. And so I got like 20 rolls, I think of P3200. Uh, and I've just been like very slowly shooting that stuff. So I, I really love it, but I don't use it a lot because P3200 and Portrait 800 and Cinestill 800T are the things that like just in my fridge, uh, I, I don't want, I like love shooting it so much, but it's so expensive that I rarely shoot it. Uh, so it's kind of an in interesting thing. I've had a couple of questions about this uh, on here, so I'll address it now. Cascade for Capture One. Uh, I started doing stuff for Capture One and started implementing that and had someone working on doing that for me. Uh, but I personally don't use Capture One, so me converting them all over correctly was gonna be difficult. Um, and I was I had someone that was supposed to do it for me and then that kind of just fell away. So. Uh, maybe I'll send an email about that today because the people from Capture One were actually talking to me about even releasing them through Capture One within their ecosystem. Uh, so maybe, uh, it's it's been a maybe for probably a year now or more even. Yeah, Capture One was actually gonna f fly me to Austria or something, where are they based? Denmark, Denmark I think they are. Um, last year around this time, and then it never happened. Uh, so anyway, long story short, I'll have to figure out Capture One stuff. There's nothing imminent. 
Uh, but I would like to get it on that platform because there's definitely demand. I always I get questions all the time about it. So, boom. Uh, someone did ask. Uh, I've had a bunch of questions about. Uh, so so Vernon, you said I recently moved over to Fuji Film, and guests at weddings ask if I'm shooting film. Do you also get that question? Yes, I get that all the time, and that's part of the reason why this whole aesthetic makes a ton of sense for me and I really love it. Uh, I'm gonna do a video on this specifically. Pulling this up to your eye is very disarming. Uh, when you pull up a, a mirrorless camera or something like that with a big lens, all that kind of thing, like if I'm running around a wedding and taking pictures with this thing, like this is not an intimidating sequence of things. This one, that one's stealth, this one's just straight beautiful. And so people think that I'm shooting a camera from, you know, the 50s. And they just think like, oh, like, uh, this is like they're the couple's like weird art school friend or something. Uh, so that's part of the reason why these are so just beautiful and inspiring and all that kind of stuff and why I really, really love them. Um, yeah, so someone, Craig, you said it would be cool to see you collab with some like other like users like Samuel L. Street Life or Stock Easy. So I just learned about Stock Easy from Samuel Street Samuel L. Street Life's live video that he did with a bunch of other people that I just woke up and opened up YouTube the other day and they were having a live stream and I jumped on there and saw said hi to some people. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of cool like Ulysses and like Karen. Uh, and Alex on Streets, uh, and Stock Easy, and then there was a bunch, East Block Boy or something was his name. Uh, so I've, I've been just trying to learn about some of these people, and so uh, it's kind of fun to be uh, in a new YouTube -y community, and I would love to do some stuff like that with those people. Um, let's see. I love the work that you do, plus you're cool in the Leica Facebook community. Got the SL2S shooting with the 2.4 Sumerit and the Voigtlander 1.2. Got the Sigma 7, 24 to 70 today. Thoughts on L mount glass non Leica. Um, so, Dwayne, thank you because I do try to be active in that um, community and that group and everything like that. I really, the SL2S is the first camera that is non M that I have considered buying for professional work. If money was no object, I would buy one to replace my EOS R because it shoots 10-bit 422 video internal with better specs than my EOS R does. It can take my Leica glass, not natively, but much more natively because the sensor is specifically designed to take M mount lenses. So I could shoot maybe like the 21 millimeter on there. It has a bigger grip. Um, so for some of the hybrid stuff, like my YouTube channel and whatnot, I could do that a lot easier with that camera. It would work. But my EOS R does the job for the YouTube channel and for what I need it for for weddings at the moment. And it's probably where I could probably get, what, like 1200 bucks for it or something like that on the used market. So that's kind of like my issue with not buying an SL2S. Uh, but I am very intrigued by it. And it at the price point, it's under 5,000, so still incredibly expensive. And again, you could buy two R6s that do most of the same thing for that same price. Um, but if I did buy into that system as well, I would probably buy Sigma lenses uh, until I could maybe afford a Leica lens or two on that system. Uh, I hear that the Oppo Summicrons for the L mount system are insane and amazing. Um, so that would be cool. Uh, I would love to do that if price was no object kind of thing, I would definitely buy one. Um, but since I have so stinking much money stacked up in these cameras, uh, I don't think one of those is on the uh, horizon at the moment, but those do seem really cool. Uh, but I would honestly probably save money and buy Sigma Art Glass for that in the meantime. Uh, because what I've seen out of the Sigma Art stuff on mirrorless specifically uh, has been pretty interesting. So it seems like the issues that most people have on DSLRs with focus 
back focusing and all that stuff. Uh, the Canon EOS R does an incredible job with eye track autofocus and all that kind of stuff. And even crappy lenses do really, really well on that camera. So I'm assuming that the Sigma stuff would be similar. Um, cool. Well, this has been going on for two hours and 15 minutes. And so I should probably chill out on this. Um, Matt, you asked about the Voigtlander Ultron. The M2 doesn't have 28 millimeter frame lines, so you're just gonna have to use the outside of the viewfinder itself. So just gonna add that in here right now. The center sharpness is good enough on film. There's your quick answer. Um, but anyway, this was fun, team. I don't think that going over two hours and 20 minutes or so is probably a great idea on this. So I'll probably peace out. And plus, I've been talking for two hours plus now, and my throat's super dry and I've drank all the coffee out of my mug here, but I have an ice cube that needs to melt. So anyway, thanks so much for watching. This has been super fun. Uh, if you have made it this far in the live chat and stuff like that, big high fives. There's still 86 people in here, which is a far, I, I'm not gonna lie, uh, because I'm new to YouTube and I, I don't really know what the thing's gonna be in here. I was wondering if there was gonna be like 10 people. So the fact that for a lot of this, there was like 100 so people on here, that makes me feel really good. So anyway, thank you so much for watching. Thanks for being a part of this. I kind of love this new YouTube community. So appreciate everyone that took the time to jump on here today. Uh, subscribe if you haven't already. Click the like button if you liked anything I said. I hate saying those things, but there's a reason you have to say it because it really does mean a lot. And then if you're still in here and wanna drop a comment, drop it away. Uh, appreciate all of you for being on here and uh, I will see you on the next video. So thanks so much, bye.